Uh, ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to you. Thank you very much for sharing your evening with us. It's great to see some familiar faces out there from previous RTS events that I've chaired. And also IBC. I wasn't there last year, but I've been there for eight or nine years. IBC, for those that don't know it, is um, a big international broadcasting convention. It's so much more than that. But it takes place in Amsterdam every year. So again, I can see some familiar faces that have been along to IBC. If you haven't been there, then you may consider going to it. Um, it's every September we're in Amsterdam at the moment and and also it's good to see a range of ages I think there's some people in the room who like me were probably excited when the first black and white TV was positioned in the lounge you thought oh what's that and if we were lucky we had one or two channels right up to current date where we have a plethora of channels and all sorts of broadcasters national and international so much choice the landscape has certainly changed and uh, this industry is so exciting in many ways it's bleeding edge or, or leading edge and we're going to find out tonight about four people's visions for the future of TV and I think they're all going to come up with slightly different content so the idea is they've all been assigned 10 minutes each and uh, that's a hint to them not to go over we've got a variety of tools to make sure that they keep within that time both ancient and medieval and futuristic to make sure they keep to time and after that I may ask them a quick question we'll have a panel discussion before we then open up to the floor so start thinking up your questions now maybe on areas you want more clarification on or some areas that we haven't covered because it's such a huge topic so I doubt we'll have a chance to cover it all off tonight. So we have four panellists for you. I'll briefly introduce you to them and then I'll do a slightly longer one as you're just about to do your presentation. Sitting next to me on my left your right is Mark Smith who's an independent marketing consultant in technology media and entertainment at MSA. I think it's had the quickest journey here tonight. Is that correct? You look like... Um, from Fetter Lane, yeah. From Fetter Lane, so an easy journey for you. But perhaps even easier, um, someone who's hosting the event tonight, uh, Khalid Hayat, um, is the Director of Consulting Technology, Media and Telecommunications at Deloitte here in London, but has never been in this room. This is a first one, <laughs> which is most bizarre, but has only been here 10 months, so there we go. So welcome to you. Um, Nigel Wally, founder and CEO of Decipher Media Consultancy. Great to have you here. An international man of mystery, which I'll tell, about, tell you all about later on. Um, try and find out some information about Nigel if you can online. He's a, what do you mean? I didn't reply to the email asking for the bio. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah that's true. Um, and then uh, Matthew Griffin, who um, has come back from the future to be with us tonight, actually from Amazing Stoke, Basing so he's That's our futurologist and 311 Institute CEO. So I've had a lovely chat with him earlier. What this guy doesn't know about technology and everything future, wow, is amazing. So hopefully he'll be able to encapsulate some of that knowledge and share some of the future vision with you. So that's our panellists. Give them, please, a big round of applause. And uh, first up, we've got Mark Smith. So Mark, as I mentioned, is an independent marketing consultant specialising in technology, media and entertainment. He's raring to go as well. He's got over 30 years' experience, looks good on it, as a marketing and comms director of the GSMA and is currently an advisor to IBC, which I just mentioned earlier. And in fact, you've got a big start-off bash day, haven't you, tomorrow at the BBC yeah. to discuss IBC this September? Well, innovation specifically. OK. Yeah, I'll talk about that. Brilliant. OK. And he's also a non-executive director of Ofcom, very posh, and several other influential organisations. So please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Mark Smith. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Nadine. Thank you, Phil, for, for asking me to come speak tonight. And uh, I guess uh, in terms of my role with IBC, of course, uh, I'm sure many of you know um, uh, that RTS is one of the owners of, of IBC, so it's kind of your key stakeholder, so uh, so to speak. Um, I guess you know my uh, time with IBC has been about two years, and and really I I came from the mobile world. I th for the last decade, I've been focused on um, media convergence with the, particularly the mobile, but the telecoms world, and so I've lived through. Uh, generations of technology from 2G now to nearly 5G. So it's, uh, we're, see, we're, we're just on the cusp of another, another revolution in, in mobile technology, which I think is probably uh, going to be the second major kind of eruption in the TV industry. I think the first was the arrival of the iPhone, uh, which really did uh, impact significantly and created a, a brand new platform for media um, and an elegant way of delivering content to consumers. And I think what we're now on the cusp of with 5G 
is a revolution not just for the consumers of content, but a revolution for the industry um, right across the value chain. So, um, yes, Mark Smith. And uh, so I'm currently working uh, particularly with IBC. I'm, I'm, I'm a member of their newly formed innovation group, but also I'm, I'm work I've been working for the last year on a whole new approach to innovation. Um, and it's really a whole new approach for IBC. It's not just uh, about um, exhibition space and about a conference. It's actually about IBC putting skin in the game uh, as a new approach to driving uh, innovation in the, in the media and entertainment ecosystem. I think uh, the media and entertainment industry, like every industry in the world today, has a number of challenges, whether they're human, whether they're political, whether they're economic, whether they're cultural. You know, we, there's a lot of challenges around things like sustainability and climate change. There's a lot of challenges around things like um, online content and potential harms online. There's a lot of challenges around business models and particularly the BBC and the license fee discussions that are going on at the moment. That's before we even get to some of the technology challenges um, facing the industry. And whether that's the transformation from the traditional broadcasting sector, uh, from the pr traditional way that content is distributed and created, to the transformation of IP uh, and moving from hardware to software um, in the industry. And then there's a whole range of immersive technologies from 8K to VR, AR, uh, mixed reality. Um, there's a number of whole uh, new uh, technology developments in cloud, artificial intelligence, in IoT, the Internet of Things, uh, blockchain, uh, disruption on many, many levels. And then you've got new distribution networks from 5G uh, to fiber rollouts um, on the horizon. All of the strategies going direct to consumer for many of the, the big uh, internet giants and Disney, Disney Plus particularly be uh, already 28 million, I think, subscribers within a matter of day, uh, a month or so. Uh, then you've got uh, the cost of, of programming and original content and the creation of that. And then you've, of course, got the escalating cost of sports rights around the world. Uh, and many, 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 many other challenges. So this requires kind of a new approach to to media and entertainment. I'm going to just stop a little bit on 5G because I think you know, there's a lot of misunderstandings about 5G and particularly when it will arrive and, and what it will be. And for the broadcast industry, I think they're multiplied, some of the misconceptions. I think the, the three key things about uh, the enhancements that 5G will bring is greater bandwidth. And we've kind of already seen that, this, this, these horrible acronyms. EMBB means Enhanced Mobile Broadband. Uh, and that means that uh, consumers already are enjoying that. Some of that's been rolled out in major cities, particularly in, in Europe and the US and, and Asia. Um, and that means that mobile connections on the, on the downlink, will, you'll be able to download content at sort of 10 gigabits per second um, and uh, 20 gigabits a second on the, on the downlink, sorry, downloading and 10 meg gigabits on the upload, sending content over the internet. So greater bandwidth, that's the key thing. High-speed connections and uh, reliable, predictable, ultra-low latency. Um, so for things like gaming, uh, for things like uh, live broadcasts over 5G, the latency will come right down under 10 milliseconds. And then you've got massive device connectivity and the ability to, do, to connect uh, multiple times, 10 to 20 times the number of devices you can on current networks. So uh, we're going to see massive change in the way the power of mobile networks to be able to distribute content. And then there's all sorts of other things like network slicing, the ability to, to dedicate bandwidth to particular sectors or use cases. Uh, and then you've got edge computing, bringing content closer to the edge of the network so uh, that it's delivered uh, at higher speeds and with more reliability. But the thing is, these come in phases, and we've only seen phase one. Um, in terms of that greater bandwidth for consumers. We've got releases of the standard this year that will see these other elements, high-speed connections and device connectivity, um, coming, the standard's just being released this year, so we won't see the rollout of that until much later this year and beyond. And I think the impact of, of 5G is not going to be felt for, for, for quite a few years yet, for two to three years at least. Um, because I think it's industry changing and it's going to require a whole new way of working for the mobile networks with industries to be able to develop these use cases and partner with them and collaborate. 
So, a uh, huge opportunity, and I think there was a report last year uh, which suggested that the uplift to the media and entertainment industry in revenues um, will be something in the region of 765 billion in revenues as a result of 5G across the world. So tremendous potential for the sector. And that, I think all of these challenges, and 5G being one of them that I mentioned, will require new approaches to innovation, significant new approaches around partnership and collaboration. And that's why IBC is developing this program to, um, to, to, to work with broadcasters, to work with internet platforms, with studios, <coughs> Um, with games companies, with music players, to actually set out their business challenges that they can't ordinarily solve on their own. And then around those challenges, um, we create project teams that address those, um, those particular problems and in a matter of three to four months, uh, try to solve those problems at which we then showcase proof of concepts at IBC. Uh, and we did a number of uh, these projects last year, working with Al Jazeera, Associated Press, RTE from Ireland, BBC R&D, uh, and BBC News, BT, and a number of other champions. And then the vendors that you see here, the manufacturers who helped to develop some solutions around some fantastic projects. So using artificial intelligence to monitor, for example, on-air content. So for Al Jazeera, if they get the accuracy of their maps wrong, their journalists can be banned from a country. You know, there are all sorts of political implications. So making sure that AI-powered uh, sort of approach to uh, accuracy of things like maps, but it, that can go much further into fact-checking against uh, fake news. But also for regulatory compliance, for example, they have to report to Ofcom and to FCC uh, on their, the, the, their content, uh, the balance of political debates, how accurate their content is. It's all done manually. They use interns, RTE, for example, uses interns to measure and write down the time in a political debate each party has spoken for today. So using AI, that can all be automated. So a few, a few projects that we did, uh, another one around mobile news gathering and in heart, using AI uh, to compress uh, video so that mobile journalists in the field, even over unpredictable mobile networks, can send their reports back to uh, their broadcast teams uh, and it doesn't get the buffering, it doesn't have all of the problems of, 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 of networks that are congested or uh, even on 3G, for example. So we enhance the quality of video that journalists can send via their mobile devices. So just the inaugural projects from last year, um, and projects, can, uh, this is a detailed slide, but projects can come across the value chain. Personally, if, if, if I was challenged, and I think Nadine has challenged me, what do you think will be the key um, challenge opportunities for the, for the industry? I think it's going to be this combination of artificial intelligence, of IP and cloud, and with 5G, that gives tremendous scope um, for uh, creators of content of every kind um, to really power uh, the way that they, they create, distribute, and the way that audiences consume content in the future. Tomorrow in London at White City House, we have um, an event whereby we're bringing a whole host of broadcasters together with uh, vendors in, in, in the industry from all over the world. We've got people coming from Facebook in, in the US, people coming from Al Jazeera in Qatar, from Canada and Grass Valley and, and many others, from France, from Italy, Germany, Belgium, all to talk about some of these challenges that are going to be pitched tomorrow. And we're going to start creating new project teams to deliver some proof of concept solutions at IBC in September. So this is all about being more agile, being more hands-on, working together, working collaboratively um, to understand some of these technologies and to be able to um, see how some of the, the problems of, of transformation, digital transformation, can be addressed by the industry. So these are called IBC accelerators, and I, I see a whole crowd of IBC guys down here who have been very supportive on getting this project off the ground and and I'm very excited about what it can do for the industry. I think that's me. Thank you. Ten minutes, I was worried about yeah. the time again. Mark, come and join me again. Just a, a couple of quick questions for you. There were great expectations, I don't know if you remember, on 3G and 4G and it didn't really sort of deliver in the hype that was expected at the time. It was more of a gradual change. Is that going to be the likely scenario for 5G as well, that it's not going to 
be a big bang, that it's going to take quite a few years for the full impact that you spoke about? I think that's slightly wrong in that I think there were huge expectations of 3G. Uh, and beca partly because of the amount that they, the, 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 the cost of the, of the 3G licenses, you know, it was back yep. then in, in the early 2000s. Uh, and the expectations were set that there was going to be a revolution. Uh, actually, 3G was a revolution somewhat, uh, and it wasn't until the iPhone came along that made sense of 3G yep. and was able to deliver a more elegant experience. I think 4G came more stealth-like. Yep. Uh, and actually was an enhancement that people really didn't expect and wasn't hyped as much. And 4G really is a superb, was a superb um, technology and is, and will continue to be part of the 5G um, uh, networks for some time yet. There's going to be a, a, a crossover. So I would dispute that about 4G being overhyped. And I think it was underhyped and overdelivered. Okay. I think the danger with 5G is that it, it could be being overhyped. And I think it, uh, in my concerns would be just by how quickly people think it's going to arrive. I think it's going to take a lot longer. And, and in terms of the impact it's going to have on the industry and those opportunities, where should people start looking now to get in when they can so they're, they're there on that leading edge of it? Uh, I think, um, actually, uh, I, I don't know if I should say, but BBC R&D has been doing an, an awful lot of work in this area, and there's particularly, you know, um, the team there, and I think there's some white papers and things coming that will explain 5G in, in language that I think is designed for the broadcast sector to understand. So that's a good place, I think, to watch yeah. some of the developments, particularly around remote production, contribution, distribution, yeah. in broadcasters' language and terms. But it was very striking what you said about collaboration as well, and it's actually the combination of several technologies, the AI, the 5G and so on, yeah. that's really going to be the game changer? Yeah, and, and so I'm going to push the accelerator to say, you know, come and this is a safe place to kind of try and experiment to um, a trusted environment with IBC to come and learn about some of these things and be a part of some of these trials and get a good understanding. So for broadcasters who want to join these as champions, there's no cost to doing that. They're funded by the vendors who help to provide the solutions, ultimately the sellers to the broadcasters. Um, so for, for champions, broadcasters, come and learn in this environment. It's a great way to experiment and work with peers in, in different broadcasters. There you go, invitation. So see Mark afterwards if you want to find out some more information about that. Thank you very much, Mark. And obviously, they've got some questions for Mark later on when we open up to the floor as well. Well, next up, we have uh, Khalid uh, Hayat, who is a specialist in the broadcasting sector. 20 years of experience across consulting and the TV industry. As I mentioned earlier, he is director in Deloitte's strategy consulting practice, working with media businesses on strategic and operating operational change. Outside of consulting, Khalid spent 11 years working in the strategy and regulatory functions at Ofcom and ITV. So Khalid, a warm welcome to you. Your 10 minutes starts when you hit the podium. Well, I'll give you a few seconds to get there. I'll walk slowly then. <laughs> No, it does work. Sorry. Right. Um, good evening, everyone, and thank you, Nadine, for the intro, and thank you, Mark, for that presentation. Um, so here in Deloitte, we've been spending quite a lot of time thinking about the future of TV and how the TV markets that we know today are going to evolve between now and 2030. So we've thought about what are the market and technology drivers that are, that are, that are affecting that change, what does that mean for broadcasters, and what kind of decisions do TV companies need to make? So let's just start by imagining ourselves in 2030. And we see a future that actually chimes with a lot of the things that Mark was just talking about. So we, we believe that the world of 2030 is characterized by what we call cloud-based, multi-platform, high-speed networks. And again, building on Mark's points, that is ultimately a cloud-based world enabled by IP and 5G networks with, with viewers accessing and interacting with content on a wide range of platforms and devices. So those networks enable what we call layered experiences. And by layered experiences, I mean experiences where you have the blurring of boundaries between different content types. And I'm particularly thinking here about the blurring of gaming and video. So if you think about what Reed Hastings has said, you know, Netflix worries as much, if not more, about Fortnite and YouTube as it does about Amazon and HBO. So 
and, and actually, this is a world where there is a wider range of revenue models for monetization of content. It's what we call snackable subs and shoppable TV. So a wide range of SVOD subscriptions and hyper-targeted advertising, including interactive and shoppable advertising. And all of this world is enabled by four or five huge global tech companies who also happen to be media companies who also happen to compete in advertising. So that's what we mean by increasing cooperation with a wider range of platforms and competitors. Now, we can have a much longer discussion about all, you know, each element of these and what it all means, but today I'm just going to focus on an aspect of the changing revenue models that we're seeing in the content space, and in particular, the way that revenues for on-demand services are evolving. It's what we call AVOD arises. Sounds a bit like a Star Wars movie. Yeah. Um, and so look, look we, all, we all know it goes without saying that subscription video on demand or SVOD is the exciting game in town, you know, with Netflix, Amazon Prime, Now TV, the likes of BritBox, Disney Plus and others. But, you know, as SVOD services proliferate, uh, you know, the question we have to ask is, will consumers be willing and able to pay for more and more SVOD subscriptions? And as a result, will subscription revenue be sufficient to fund the massive content investment that we're seeing in the market? Now, here in Deloitte, we believe that there is an ongoing, important, and indeed growing role for advertising video on demand, or, or AVOD, you know, both here in the UK and around the world. So let's look at a few examples. And as, as we get into this, let's just remind ourselves that you know, you know, we've obviously had AVOD in the UK well before we had SVOD, right? So the likes of all four ITV Hub and others. So this is not a new idea, and I'm not pretending it's a new idea. But what's interesting is, is, is that we're seeing you know, advertising video on demand becoming more and more important around the world both as standalone free-to-view services, but also as adjuncts or as, you know, uh, ad-supported tiers within otherwise pay services. So in terms of some of the examples on the screen, HBO has got a, a range of streaming services, uh, and, and uh, someone please correct me if I get this wrong, but because there's, 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 there, there's a range of them, right? So you've got HBO Now is a standalone service. HBO Go is available to HBO pay TV subscribers. And HBO Max is an upcoming service, which is a pay and is and will be a pay service, but is expected to have an ad-supported tier in 2021. Hulu has got a range of pricing models. So you've got an ad, an ad-free tier and an ad-supported tier, where you know the ad the ad-supported tier is half the price of the of the premium ad-free version. And you know, and it is it is interesting that Hulu generated $1.5 billion in ad revenues in 2018. And the Roku channel is quite a new entrant into this space and carries a wide range of free-to-view content, as well as the ability to add on or top up a range of premium pay subscriptions. And Pluto TV is actually really interesting. So Pluto, you know, as we know, is, is owned by Viacom and exists in a range of countries. It's in the US, it's in the UK, it's launching in, in Latin America uh, later this year. And there, there's an interesting stat around Pluto, which I think could, could be of interest and could give some lessons to broadcasters that are thinking about, you know, how do we continue to engage and connect with younger audiences, you know, in a world where it's getting harder and harder to do that. So we've got the stat there that, uh, that Pluto has got 20 million monthly active users in the US. Well, half of those monthly active users are in the 18 to 34 age category. So that's a much younger audience profile than many mainstream US and UK TV services. So if those are some existing and imminent examples, there are, there are, there are more that are coming and, 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 and uh, are worth thinking about. So Quibi will offer premium short form uh, audiovisual content primarily to smartphone users. And it's had $1 billion of investment from a range of players, including Disney, WarnerMedia, Viacom, Alibaba, and ITV. And it's going to carry exclusive content from the likes of Steven Spielberg and Justin Timberlake and others. Now, Quibi will, will be a pay service, but it will have ad-free and ad-supported pricing tiers. And the majority of subscribers are expected to opt for the ad-supported version. 
And Peacock is Comcast's upcoming uh, streaming service. You know, and we've seen the news reports about how NBC, part of the Comcast family, is going to pull the US version of The Office from Netflix in order to carry it on its own in-house streaming service from 2021. So again, that the, the, the ad-supported version of, of Peacock will be free to Comcast subscribers, and it will be available out there in the, in the market to non-subscribers, but, you know, but at a lower price than the premium, uh, premium ad-free uh, premium variant. And looking further afield, you know, the, the, the massive and fast-growing markets, the likes of China and India, are actually really, really interesting. So if you think about these markets, huge populations, lots of demand for content and, and consumption of content, but potentially with a variable degree of willingness and ability to pay for subscription services. There what we see is that you know, the large ad-supported video players in those markets have got more active users than what we think of as the huge global SVOD players. So to conclude, what does that mean? What does all of this mean for us here in the UK? So we in Deloitte, we predict that revenues from AVOD services will reach 500 million pounds, half a billion pounds here in the UK in 2020. So that is up 17% on 2019. So it's more than three times the growth of traditional TV advertising. So in, in doing so, AVOD is going to be an important complement to linear and SVOD revenue streams. So it represents 10% of the total TV advertising market. And yes, AVOD is smaller than SVOD, no doubt about it. We expect SVOD revenues to break £1 billion in the UK in 2020. My Fitbit just buzzed, it's distracting. But so yes, SVOD is going to continue to be hugely important, but AVOD will be, remain you know, a, a hugely important part of the overall revenue mix. And how might this all play out over the next few years? Again, we predict that by 2025, the majority of stream services, both mainstream and niche, will rely on advertising as a significant or indeed sole source of revenue. So SVOD services will remain important, but very few services, maybe only one or two huge global players, will be able to rely on subscription revenues alone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. I suppose, in a way, every consumer would like less ads, but the reality is that some people can't afford to pay those subscription prices, and particularly yeah. if you've got that younger audience profile where pocket money, I've read in one of your reports, typically it's about £13 a month for age ranges between 11 and 15, so I'm actually going to reduce the money I give to my children and set it at the average. They only get slightly above that. Um, so do you see that then as a trend that people will eventually just say, well, actually, I can't afford to pay subscription, so I'm just going to like it or lump the adverts? Well, I guess there's two bits there, right? So one is, I mean, we deliberately talk, and we didn't delve into this, but we talk about snackable subs. And we call them snackable subs for a reason, because unlike traditional pay TV with, you know, the, the Sky and Virgin, where you have to sign up for a 12-month contract or an 18-month contract, you could dip in and out of, of, of the likes of Netflix and now TV as, as, as you please, right? So I, mean, I, so I do it, I'm sure m many of us do. There's a particular series I want to watch on now TV, I'll sign up. If, I, if my son wants to watch a Spurs match, you know, he'll sign up for an TV day pass, whatever it might be. So I think that's one part of it. So, so I think what we're seeing is you know, the ability to, in, to, to buy into mini pay services that hopefully you know, offset some of the affordability questions that you're talking about. So that's, so that's one part of it. The other part of it is actually about the enduring importance and power of, of advertising. And I was actually just talking to a colleague of mine on, on the way here. Um, and there's some data from Ubiquiti, I haven't seen it, but he says he's going to send it to me. Um, that, that, that actually, that, that, that research shows that if you actually uh, um, put videos on people watching advertising, people pay attention to TV advertising more than they pay attention to, a, to any other type of video advertising. So there is still power there. There is still power there. And a lot of the change in the markets we saw from your last slide is driven by some big global players. Yeah. I mean, China and India, that was quite staggering, actually, looking at the, the power they've got um, now and in the future. So what does this mean for UK broadcasters? How are they going to change and act like global players if they're not already? Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, look, so I, mean, I think there's, I mean, there's the inevitable question of scale, as you say, right? Um, and, and, you know, and I think increasingly what we're seeing and, you know, working with and talking to a lot of, lot of broadcasts in the market is global partnerships, you know, matter more and more. So we see, you know, the likes of you know, Discovery doing deals with various national broadcasters around the world to, to, to enter markets, and, and et cetera. So I think partnerships is part of it in order to be able to compete and think and act globally. But at the same time, what we have in the UK market, particularly where we've got the BBC, ITV, the public service broadcasters, and Channel 4, as, you know, as we refer to them, there's the, there, there's, the, there's the need to strike the balance between the global and the local, right? So, you know, regional broadcasting and, you know, and, 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 work and, and spreading value across nations and regions of the UK has always been really important in, in, in the broadcasting ecology here. Um, and, you know, given the government's focus on levelling up the north and so on and so forth, there is a challenge for UK broadcasters in, you know, how, you know what, what more are we going to do? Channel 4 is opening, open its HQ in the north. You know, ITV and BBC have been there for some time. The BBC is talking about opening up tech, tech hubs and other, uh, other activities outside London. But it's, it, but it's about striking that balance between serving the UK and representing the UK, whilst also building the scale of partnerships to compete globally in the marketplace. Great, thank you very much indeed. Okay, well, next up we've got Nigel Wally, I mentioned founder and CEO of Decipher Media Consultancy. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Nigel. I will. Uh, so, we are a small little specialist media agency, um, and I suppose we've always championed the consumer. So we've looked yes. at how consumers adopt new tech, um, we, how consumers um, change their media consumption because of new tech, um, and we've kind of reflected that back into models for broadcasters, for TV platforms, um, and various content makers. Okay. So I'm here in a way to kind of champion the consumer. I've got a whole speech about watching Love Island on live broadcast TV, so I'm feeling a bit stupid now. Yeah. So. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> have you given yourself away from South Africa? Have you been there yourself? <laughs> yeah. All right. um, Welcome to you, Nigel. Thank you. No, no, um, on a serious note, we, I do believe that we are in a period of, of significant change for the TV industry, so I think it's absolutely right to be having this debate um, now. Um, I would make the point that probably the TV industry is going into um, what we would consider its fourth significant phase. This isn't the first time we've been through this loop of, of a digital revolution. Um, you know, th this is at, at least the fourth digital revolution the TV industry's gone through. And when we're thinking about the future, it's, it's interesting to just kind of think about that journey. There are obviously many futures um, you know, our, our future window is kind of three, five years out, uh, and if I'm drunk at a dinner party, maybe ten. Um, so, so when I'm talking about the future as we see it, I'm, I'm kind of talking about the, you know, the next five years um, and, and maybe just a little bit further um, afterwards. But when we go back to the beginning, um, going through these stages, uh, when some of the older people in the room... Um, first encountered TV, as you mentioned earlier on. Um, it was a single device in the corner of the room. It wasn't particularly a, um, a, a technology. We didn't view it as a technology. Uh, in that era, what we might call simple TV, the big tech innovations were the jump from black, black and white to color, um, the arrival in halting forms of the remote control, as the older guys will remember, there was some you know, cable running across the, uh, the floor to the lounge. Um, I have to mention teletext, because Graham Lovelace is in the room. Um, you know, so you know, the, the first on-screen interfaces we saw, the first on-screen text interfaces that anyone in the UK saw, it wasn't the internet, it was actually teletext, it was on-screen text, um, which the older ones will remember was actually a separate box by the side of the TV when it first arrived um, and was slowly integrated in. So it, it wasn't a, an innovation-free period, um, but it was the first halt time um, when innovation arrived in TV, we didn't really talk about TV functionality. And then, of course, 20 years ago, um, the second wave of, of television revolution happened when um, the American TV giants brought set-top boxes over. And for the first time, we had set-top boxes in our life. Um, it, the second era of TV was still one very much centered on the corner of the lounge. Um, it was a single device in, in, in consumers' homes still. Um, but for the first time, the broadcast industry suddenly had to realize that there was other commercial players in what we were calling the TV industry. We saw platforms arrive for the first time. Um, so big broadcasters had to deal with, with what um, they were calling disintermediation at the time, a dreadful um, aberration of an English word. Um, but this notion that, that big, nasty companies had stepped between the broadcast industry uh, and the end viewer. And we had to do a lot of work thinking about the value chain, the idea that the BBC didn't have customers, it had consumers, it had viewers, and, and other organisations had stepped between the BBC and ITV uh, and, and their viewer. It was, the, it was the first time we had this kind of commercial wake-up. And, and you know, in that era, we jumped from five channels to 500, 
commercial TV um, writ large. We had innovation around um, commercial models. We had subscription channels for the first time. We had pay-per-view for the first time. We had innovations around um, advertising, stripping of adverts across whole days. So lots of content innovation, but the TV industry was still very much focused on broadcast. It was the only thing we could consider at the time um, until really the, the advent of the personal video recorder in, in that period. And then we started to see things, things change. Um, I always flag up to the younger people that on-demand television arrived in the UK prior to the internet. Um, and we remember back in those days, set-top boxes became a device we began to talk about as a thing which could be revolutionary. This device that sat in the corner of our lounge, increasingly with, with computer memory, enabled these, these terrible businesses, these platforms that were sitting between us and our viewers, to, to mess around with our signal, to record it, and to even drop video on demand um, files onto it and offer the consumer on-demand television, free and pay, before the arrival of the internet. Um, so it's an interesting kind of thing. The power of owning and controlling a device in a, in a consumer's home is, is, was kicked off in that period. And we really then moved into the third period when people started plugging broadband into the back of the devices we watched telly through. So the internet arrived, we moved into this kind of third era of TV, which a large part of the UK is still in. An era which we call multifunction, because if you go into most people's homes and watch what they use to watch television, it's still weighted towards the lounge. But as we know, all these other devices, phones, tablets, laptops have come into our life, and TV has spread out around the home and to the bus stop and to all these other places. But there is still a great weighting of TV um, towards the lounge. We have very sophisticated interfaces now, which are really on their way to being websites on TV. We have um, still have um, recording. We have on-demand. Um, so we have multiple functions by which we can find TV, choose TV, and use it. We've got TV being delivered into this environment, still over broadcast. Um, we've got now, on top of that, we've got TV being delivered um, in a variety of different IP flavors into set-top boxes and into devices. So the, there's been an explosion um, in the ways our core product can be delivered into TV. There's been an explosion in the ways that we can offer it either live or on demand. So in one respect, um, it's an amazing time to be a TV consumer, as we are now. The thing I would flag up, um, which is why we believe we're moving into a, a new fourth era of TV, and this kind of five to ten year future is going to be so exciting, is that consumers are actually starting to get pissed off with what we're doing. We went into a consumer's home the other day. They had 23 screens around their home through which they could get some form of PSB content. Um, when you added up all the phones, the tablets, the laptops, the games machines, the old TV in the kitchen that used to be the one in the back room, but the one in the back room was, used to be the one in the lounge, and the one in the lounge was new, and they all moved around. The one up in the bedroom used to be 10 years ago was the one in the, in the bedroom, but the one up in the bedroom has got a fire TV stick in it. Now, the one in the, in the conservatory isn't particularly smart, so they suck a Chromecast in so the kid can flick up his TV. You, 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 you've all seen those terms. None of us ever wrote a strategy paper that suggested that consumers would have 23 screens in their home through which they could get PSB content in some form. But there they are, it's reasonably standard. Um, we talk to these consumers and what's so weird about it, never having so much content, never having so many service options and never having so many commercial options, how unhappy they are. <laughs> um, and and th I, it's a flippant point, but it's hugely important for when we talk about what is the future that's coming. Because right now, all we're seeing is an explosion of confusion. This, this explosion of, of direct-to-consumer models is not a good thing. It is the last hurrah of a fucked-up period that we're going to have to solve in this future that we're going to be dealing with. Because consumers are telling us the last thing, thing they want is another five subscriptions on their monthly bill. So we're going through this cycle where everything fragments, Everyone wants to go direct to consumer. Consumers don't want people to go to direct consumer. This is, this, is, this is supplier push being thrown at the consumer. And the big wave of change we're going to see in this next year of TV is aggregation. Because consumers want one company to solve it for them. Please get all that crap, bring it together into a single interface and a single bill, please, will be the big driving solution in the next era. It happens in every wave of change in TV. So right now, we're seeing fragmentation, but do not think this fragmentation is the beginning of the new era. This fragmentation is the end of a bad era we are currently in. Um, and in this new era, the winners will be those companies that can deliver simplification, aggregation, they will be those companies that can move content simply between all these devices in, in consumers' lives. It's the, the, the companies that can make connections that help the TV industry move its content between consumers and between devices. I do um, agree with one of the points earlier on that it may not be the same companies we've been dealing with up till now. Um, 
you know, if we look at who's playing in this world, quite clearly, one of the big features of this next era of TV, this, the, the next 10 years, is the arrival of new players um, into positions um, where familiar old platforms have, have been very comfortable but not very good. So the arrival of, of Amazon as a credible television platform is a phenomenon. I would make the point that the numbers we were looking at on the, on the screen earlier on weren't for broadcasters, they were for platforms. We've seen our first 100 million pay TV platform, 100 million customer pay TV platform in China. And when you think, you know, Sky in the UK is 12 million, 100 million pay TV platform has an incredible amount of, of power to build new technology and to build consumer services. So we will increasingly see the rise of the global platform, which will be an exciting thing. It is likely in, this, in the next 10 years we will have Android homes. A man said to us in research the other day, I bought a new television. That's great, we said. What did you get? He said, I got the new Sony because it runs Android. Why did you do that, we said. It's a great TV. Um, he said, I got it because I'm running Google Nest at home and it made sense to get the same software on my telly as I'm running from my central heating. And the weirdest thing was we all nodded. <laughs> it made sense. Yeah, and you got an Android phone, Google Nest, Android TV, yeah, yeah. And actually, if you plug Google Assistant in it, it just all talks to each other. And so we will be looking in this new era at those companies who can tie together all the weird crap we bought um, from B&Q in the last 10 years. Because we hear it in research. Yeah, I've got Sky Q, it's got voice, but I've got Sonos for my music. But I've got Alexa in the kitchen, and none of the things talk to each other. Mm -hmm. um, so people are running multiple voice systems. You know, I'm, I'm at saying this at an RTS conference. Average consumers are running two to three different incompatible voice command systems in their homes. What a strange world. In this new future, it will be the companies who can tidy that mess up. Um, so, and it, as... One of the speakers said earlier on, it will be the big global tech companies increasingly creating global platforms. However, as a final point, and as we are at the RTS, I should stress that when I've got that fully interconnected array of devices around my home that allow me to move content between devices and services, allow me to voice command and pause and pick up in another room, I will still be watching Love Island Live on ITV. <laughs> because 75% of content last year when you look at the broadcast magazine ratings, was content that came from local broadcasters. It's local market TV with a very strong emphasis on live. And we do lament the loss of youth audiences in this world, but you look at the breakdown of the audience for Love Island. We make the right content, youth audiences will watch it, and they will watch it as families and on their own in, the, in this new world. It's an, actually an exciting time if you make great content. It's not the death of broadcast. It's not the death of, of old-fashioned TV. It's a rejigging of how we get it to the consumer um, so there will be significant change in the next 10 years. Um, but as we say, everything changes, everything stays the same. Thank you. Poetry in motion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's interesting what you said about um, the death of TV is not going to happen. But things have changed. The days when we used to watch 20 million people watching an event, whether it was a soap opera, it's now 10 million we get excited about. 20 years ago, if, if people posted 10 million viewers, then it was deemed a failure. Mm. But in fact, that's now deemed a success. So do you not see that over time there's that slow erosion that suddenly it may not seem like you're falling off the cliff, but in 10 years' time, some of those programmes will have fallen off the cliff? I'm nervous of the word erosion. You know, if you look at ITV, 20 years ago, they'd have got 20 million. They only had one channel. They've now got five or six channels, depending on which platform you're looking at, and on demand, and share of ITV Hub Plus and BritBox. So they've got smaller numbers on individual elements, but they've got eight or nine different routes to market. So the world has certainly changed, and, and big broadcasters, particularly the PSBs, are different. Um, and the audiences have moved on to new things, but new entrance into an industry is not a bad thing. New entrance shows that there's money out there that wants to come and play in our industry. Yeah. New, new platforms or new broadcasters or new S4 players bringing new money into TV is not a bad thing. It, that is, that is a, um, a declaration of faith in the core industry, which is entertaining people with beautiful precision TV. Indeed, so it's not necessarily about the viewers and the amount that you're getting, but it's about the lack of churn. Hmm. And also the amount of people subscribing as well are factors of success yeah. rather than just looking at your traditional viewing figures. So how do we solve then this fragmentation because you're seeing more companies offering fragmented services. So where's the tipping point going to be? Because people are paying for them at the moment. Yeah, but, but we're seeing it already. We're seeing consumer demand for, for, you know, is there a website where I can find out, you know, one place where you can tell me everything that's on? And we're like, yeah, it's called an EPG, love. You know, um, <laughs> um, you know so, so 
if these, these arguments are circular, uh, circular, you know, the, um, there will be people who build the better EPG, which combines, you know, a website and, and all that kind of stuff. I just want to know, you know, where every episode of every series of um, Spiral is on. This is one of the, the examples that came out of, of a, um, a consumer group the other day. They said to us, we wanted to watch that French series Spiral that was on, episode, series seven was on BBC, so we thought we'd watch it from the beginning. We had to go to Netflix for series one and two, we had to go to, to Amazon Prime for <laughs> three and four. We couldn't find five. We jumped to, to six and seven on the BBC, and they said it was madness. All we do, we, did, we were declaring a desire to watch every episode of, and every series of a TV programme. Yeah. And the industry has put these barriers between us and them to make it really hard to do. And they were saying, isn't there just a single place I can go and find all that stuff? We're willing to pay. Um, and so part of the future will be resolving these barriers we're putting between the consumer and, and great content mm -hmm. and making it easier to move seamlessly between the propositions. And, and as I say, the, the, those companies that can do that We'll win out. Yep, Nigel, wise words. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, well, our last uh, speaker is Matthew Griffin, founder, futurist, and CEO of the 311 Institute and World Futures Forum, focusing on the dates between 2020 to 2070. Now, I used to love futurologists. I've interviewed many over the years, and they predict stuff to the future, knowing that they wouldn't be around then. But life expectancy uh, means that you probably will be. So we're going to invite you back in 2070 to see where anything you've said comes true. Now, he's been described as the advisor behind the advisors and works with governments and multinationals, including Discovery, you mentioned to me, Disney, Interdigital, Netflix and Sky, to help them see and plan for the future. Hopefully you can tell them the comments that Nigel said as well, well. when you next do. So please uh, give it up for Matthew Griffin, everybody. Hey, everyone. How are you all doing? Good? Excellent. Yes. Okay, so... As we start uh, looking at this, um, so I've got a relatively large deck. I'm going to condense it down because I have 10 minutes. You're watching a pop star, right? You're not watching a pop star. You're watching an artificial intelligence pop star that's been signed up by Sony. She has half a billion YouTube views. And uh, her name is Ampna. So she's an artificial intelligence pop star. Warner Brothers have also signed up a whole variety of other AI pop stars, basically. So, are we really talking about the future of TV? Do I really watch a black box on my wall or do I really watch content? Because if we're really talking about the future of content, we're going somewhere crazy. So, I work with a whole variety of different organisations. Basically, I work with T-Mobile, basically, when we have a look at 5G, basically, the whole world, basically, is changing. Every single organisation, every single industry is changing. It's being pulled apart from the inside out. If you want to have a look at some of the technologies that I am literally going to scan through, if you go to the website, you can download this. There are 200 exponential technologies listed in there. Sort of in sort of very quick format like this. However, um, one, of the pieces I worked, did, one of the pieces of work I did recently was for Disney. How do you push an artificial intelligence button and create a Marvel blockbuster movie? So if you want a copy of this, let me know. But I'm going to show you some stuff. So we get to it. If we have a look at today, basically increasingly today, the pace of change is accelerating. Everything is getting more complex. If you step back to the 1980s, 1990s, and I said, what do you think you can do with technology next year that you couldn't do this year? You might look at computer chips and say, computer chips are faster. We can ingest more information, analyze more information, and I can do stuff with that. Now, though, basically, we're certainly talking about all of these different technologies. What next year could you do with 5G, artificial intelligence, augmented reality, blockchain, quantum computing in 2025, robotics, virtual reality? And are you moving to the cloud? Are you digitizing your businesses as well? If you're digitizing your business, you're collapsing all of the boundaries between every industry. You can move from one industry to the other seamlessly, a.k.a. Facebook, Google, and all the rest of them. However, when we have a look at exponential technologies, basically there aren't kind of just the 10 exponential technologies we always talk about. Again, this is in the codex, which is why I put that up. There are over 500 exponential technologies that I track. I put them onto this starburst. This represents 168 exponential technologies. We will not go through all of them. The timeline goes from 2020 to 2070. Each individual dot tells you when the technology will mature. Each individual technology is worth at least a total addressable market of over half a trillion dollars, and each individual dot will tear down one industry or all of them. So to give you an idea, artificial intelligence is just one dot. Um, however, 
as we start talking about the future of content, basically we're going to talk about uh, intelligence, so for example, creative machines, and then when we start talking about uh, television itself, up there we can have a look at user interface, because you don't care about the technologies that we're using to create this content or to push this content to you. You just care about what you're watching and how you access it. Fine? So, with no more ado, basically we will go into a couple of the uh, sort of little areas. So when we start having a look at the different tools that you have available to you as a creator, we can democratize anything. If you're a crappy artist, what if we were to change all that to, to can you draw the picture on the left? We democratize creativity using artificial intelligence. This is just images, 2D static. Wouldn't it be great if everybody could be an artist? If we could take our ideas and turn them into compelling images? This technology allows us to create a smart paintbrush so that if you wanted to create a new picture, you can just draw the shapes of the objects that you want and the neural network can then fill in all the details. Congratulations, you are now an artist. If we add a water feature. The network is able to add reflections, not because we told it that, but because it learned it. Or if we change the ground to be covered in snow, then it knows. So that now you the get the idea. To I'm going to fast different. forward. How many of you can't simply be bothered, basically, to draw anything on a piece of paper? If we look a little bit into the deeper future, we can now stream your thoughts to YouTube. We use a brain-machine interface, we combine it with artificial intelligence, and we can read your minds. These are already used in hospitals. But when we start looking 2030-ish, these technologies, this, the information you will see on the screen will be high definition. Three years ago, you couldn't do this. So what we're doing, basically, is we have volunteers who are looking at the images on the left, and the artificial intelligence and brain-machine interface is combining and reading information from billions of neurons in real time to generate the image you see on the right. So when I ask you, how was your holiday? And you suddenly start thinking about your, your life on the beach. You can stream that to YouTube. These, in about three years' time, basically will be high definition. And we can already what we can already start putting people in front of screens. They will watch elephants walking across the screen, and you see the elephant walking across the screen, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So if you want to create content in the future, just think. However, if you can't be bothered to think, uh, you might as well just write. Um, so this is a general adversarial network. This is out of Stanford and Princeton. So these are all basic. But remember, exponential technologies accelerate very, very fast. If you want to create a video, type what you want the video to do. And then creative machines will create synthetic content. And you can see the man in the middle is playing golf. This is all synthetic content. The gener second generation is much bigger, much better. It's higher definition. Again, fast forward three, four years. Basically, this will be, you thump this into a platform like Google. I throw it on your smartphone. Basically, you text on your smartphone, or you say, create a video of a man playing golf. The system does it. Deep fakes, three years ago, basically, they were in labs. If you wanted to create a very badly convincing deep fake, you needed AI experts being paid about $1.2 million. And you'd look at the deep fakes and go, that's rubbish. That's it. Now, basically, you can download Zhao as an app in China. You scan your face, and it will put your face into a Leonardo DiCaprio movie, and it's quite convincing. <laughs> this stuff accelerates. However, what about if we just let AI take the strain? So if we start looking at this, one of the companies I work with is MPC. They created the Lion, Mo and the Lion King. If you think about The Lion King, we now have gaming and content creation coming together because The Lion King is unique. It was created in virtual reality. They went out to all the savannas and everything else. They used the Unreal Engine basically to create essentially a game. But it's a virtual reality environment. And then they had dollies basically in just an empty space. And all the cameramen basically were crouching down and in their virtual reality environment taking images of Simba and so on and so forth. Gaming and regular content creation are going to collide. And again, if you have a look at today's games, they're kind of 4K. Basically, the resolution isn't necessarily photo real. We accelerate that out. However, if we're going to start creating blockbusters using artificial intelligence, where we do just punch a magic button and say, create me some dynamic video content or whatever it happens to be, we don't just need one discipline. 
We need lots of artificial intelligence disciplines basically to mature. Once all of these bars basically start getting green, you then integrate them on the top. The first, the first movie and video that you create basically is rubbish, and everyone goes, it's rubbish. The second is a bit better. Third is okay. Fourth, you're liking that. Fifth, you're paying for it. Sixth, you're starting to subscribe to it. So if you want to create a, an, a synthetic video, the AI needs to understand aesthetics, biomechanics, natural, the laws of nature. It needs to understand what a storyline is. What's the start of a story? What's the end of a story? What is emotion? How do I figure that one out? And all sorts of things. But we need the individual elements. So we need voices. So this is using WaveNet Google's WaveNet technology. If you want to get past Uncanny Valley, you make the voices imperfect. Sure, what time are you looking for around? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 1.15. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's your first name? The first name is Lisa. So think about conversational interfaces and everything else. This is your voice. You can give this thing an accent. You want it with a Birmingham accent. You want it with an angry Birmingham accent. It can do that. That's your voice. Now, basically, when we start having a look at other synthetic content, this is just images. These are 2D images created by a general adversarial network from NVIDIA. That's high definition. Three years ago, that was black and white and horrible. This thing keeps going. But when we create 2D static images, the next thing that we do is we create 3D static images. And then we start creating 3D dynamic images. And we start moving closer and closer to video. This thing will keep going. This is a full body deep fake, basically out of Japan. So you can now start seeing we have a different elements coming together. There's lots of different ways we can create synthetic content in the future. These are your people. You stick them in front of a synthetic background, basically, and off you go. And it'll just keep going. It's compute power. However, here's an advert, basically, that was actually written by an artificial intelligence. It looked at all of the award-winning car movie, uh, car adverts, and it figured out, basically, the script. All of the world's best top award-winning car adverts have emotion. They've got grit, all this kind of thing. So this was filmed by a human director, and this has since picked up awards. So we have artificial intelligence script writers. emotional and she's very very happy the car didn't crash <laughs> however when we start having a look at digital humans Samsung recently released neon soul machines basically have got a whole variety of different digital avatars you can create different avatars in different ways we can create content in different ways this is just one way out of lots when we start having a look at some of these digital humans especially this is Lil Michaela she's a virtual influencer with 1.5 million uh, Instagram followers She's fairly static at the moment, but she's landed millions of dollars in deals. However, if we now start taking Soul Machine's avatar, he's a neural network avatar, all of a sudden, basically, we have Hi, this. I work at Victor helping young now, he's the old about one. Renewable energy. The new these one, basically, you can't tell, basically, they're not the human. Time. Nat West are using these, basically, to sell mortgages. Expert. What should we start with? He has a neural Magma network the brain. Comes close to the surface, and we end up with volcanoes. Could be an actor. Hot springs and guys. Or we could create actors you know in a variety of different is. ways. Molten rock from the outer core. Absolutely but Will has taught right. 250,000 really children really about renewable energy. Like he's there, looking at us. Like it's like a real human. 
Here's a quick question for you. You can also react to your emotions. So as we start having a look at procedural content, where you're watching your TV, you're getting a little bit boring. We can do high definition rendering in the cloud using all these different technologies. It can create a plot line for you in real time. curious if they liked me. So all of a sudden, it picks you back up again. So we're not just talking about producing content. We're produce, talking about eventually producing procedural content, which is almost a utopia for companies like Netflix and the gang. And that is it. So that is a quick 10-minute jaunt uh, through the future of content and creativity. Thank you, There you go. Come back to the present now. Um, when you were interviewed earlier by RTS, they asked you, yeah. how would you sum up the future of TV? And you said democratisation. Yeah. So explain that to the okay. audience. What did you mean by that? So democratisation. So if I said, so on the one hand, all of you can become broadcasters today, right? You can whip out your phones, basically you're on 4G networks and everything else. If you've got a YouTube account with enough subscribers, basically you can live stream to the world. So every single, in, every single one of you can already become a broadcaster. And the cost of that, if I did that now, my contract is $14 a month. I don't pay for YouTube. That's it. I'm a broadcaster for $14 a month. However, when we start having a look at, are you producing interesting content? Yeah, sure, we can do some video blogging and everything else, but that's kind of our limit at the moment. However, as we start seeing all of these different technologies emerge, what happens but when you start getting to the point where you can create content on your phone, like deepfakes? So, for example, with Zao, you know, all you do with Zao is you scan your face, and then it'll put you into a movie. So what happens, basically, when you have an artificial intelligence running in the cloud or running on the neural chip, basically, in your phone, and you simply say, create a movie of me down the beach. Scan your face, and you upload that. So when we start talking about democratization, all of these different technologies democratize. Google democratized your access to information. How many of you know, basically, the boiling point of hydrogen? Look it up. You'd tell me, basically, in five seconds. So technology is democratizing access to information. With artificial intelligence, we're starting to democratize access to expertise, whether it's lawyers, whether it's accountancy, whether it's finance, robo-advisors, whatever it happens to be. So that's why, that's why I talk about democratization, because increasingly, when all of these technologies start integrating and coming together, we will all be creators, in which case everyone then becomes a platform and then we're subscribing to billions of people. Is it the opposite of Nigel's simplification, though? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and don't get me wrong. You're absolutely right. You've always got to put the... From a, customer, from a company perspective, you have to put the customer first. But if you sort of step back five years ago, how many of you had access, basically, to all of these different platforms and choices? What the world is trying to say is, look at all the choices that you have. Come to our platform. Do this, do that. And frankly, basically, if you can all become content creators, I mean, if you have a look at, for example, YouTube, how many influencers and video bloggers, basically, are on YouTube? They're all clamoring for your attention. Yeah, that problem gets worse, not better in the future. And then you have the large companies that then start talking about media rights and everything else. We have lawyers. So I work with lawyers coming in on the IP side as well. Um, it's a whole, yeah, it's a whole yeah. <laughs> yeah, bag of nuts. <laughs> yeah. So just wanted to, are you human or are you a robot? Just want to double check. No, I do, human. You're, you're a human. Yeah. So, Carly, how does this all sound to you? What's been striking for you from the other panellists? Well, I mean, it's a good question. I mean, it's... it's I mean, it's, I guess it's fascinating to think about, you know, the themes of, you know, change, but also consistency, right? So, in, you know, in terms of the impact that 5G can have, in terms of the fact that actually 75% of content is still watched linear, as you, as you, as you, as you say, Nigel. So, you know, consumers like comfort, and I, and I think... We, you know, we, we shouldn't lose, you know, lose sight of the fact that you know, what we what we may think of as starting with legacy technologies, there'll be older, vulnerable viewers, etc., for whom you know the traditional TV set will be a lifeline for a long time. But actually, the world that Matthew's talking about is hugely exciting, and and, and, and for media businesses, thinking about how do you you know embrace that world and think about well, what do I need to own and control in that world versus 
what can I do in partnership with others or mm. actually just exit from because I, I can't play and I can't have a comparative advantage in that world. It's, it, it's, it's, it's fascinating. And Nigel, have you changed your viewpoint? Do, do you want more No, not at all. We get one of these every five years and, it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> and it goes away. And, and, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's good fun, don't get me wrong. It's great. It's nothing to do with TV. Yeah, um, we, we forget there's a basic economic principle in life which has been the same for 3,000 years, which is specialisation. I, I, you know, I can make my own bread, I don't because it's better than the baker does it. Um, you know, I, I, can do myself, I can do my own everything, but I don't because society is better when people specialise in stuff. The very last thing most people want to do is make their own telly when there's people out there who want to make telly for them. Um, so yes, technology would allow everybody to do everything themselves, but actually the reason we have a TV industry is, is because there are other people out there who are better at coming up with ideas for television programmes and creating them and presenting them to me. So I can get on with my day job, and the TV industry can get on with this day job, and we meet together in the evenings and the afternoons, and, and a beautiful thing happens. So just because you can doesn't mean you should, doesn't mean you will. Um, and, you know, so, so we... The, this clash between tech and art is, is this kind of perpetual debate in the TV industry. At the core of the TV industry is art, is, is creative lunatics doing great things and making great TV, surprising TV, serendipity. Um, I turn on the TV not knowing what I want to watch, not knowing what some creative person has wanted to put in front of me. And that's the great thing. That's the magic of TV. Um, and that will never go away. There will always be people who want to tell stories and who want to put their stories in front of me, um, which is great. Um, and so there will always be that, that business. I'm not saying that the tools that they use won't evolve. You know, cause, because actually what you were really describing was an evolution of tools. Um, it, it was a toolkit for creative people to, to um, better illuminate their stories and their images for me as a thing, which is great. The, the tools always improve, and you know we've seen it this year with the arrival of um, the Irishman. You know, the first time a big top line movie has used proper AI to create characters. So some of the stuff you were talking about has kind of made itself into the mainstream, but it was still a tool that a creative person cr used to make a piece of creative output in the shape of something which I recognised. It's a movie, um, and we, we watched it in the same way. So. Mark, you've been nodding your head. Are we just yeah. all fuddy-duddies, though? In fact, the younger people will actually relate more to what um, I, I've has been, been said. I was thinking that. I mean, you know, when I think about my children, and, and you know, they probably watch Love Island as the only normal TV, traditional TV they watch. TikTok is the big hot thing at the moment, but it's, you know... It's a combination of things, and, and actually they get them all free anyway, because I, through Netflix, through my subscription, and Spotify through my, so the day when they have to pay is going to be an interesting <laughs> But the, the thing is, I think about these things and everything everybody's been talking about in a, with a number of different hats on, so I think about my Ofcom kind of work, and you know, I think the regulators have been very, very slow to, to come up to speed in this, in, this, in this online world, and I think, you know, they haven't even decided here who's mm. going to be the online regulator. Ofcom's mm. taking a piece of it. And, yeah. uh, and I think there's a lot of catching up just to where we are today, never mind about what's coming. Yeah. And how do you possibly regulate around some of those things? And all the things, by the way, that TV does, like preserve culture and ensures we have diversity and represents the population. I'm not sure that's going to pass, and you know, that the future things are going to pass, but that's if the regulators can keep up. Mm. The technology hat that for me is very excited, but I agree with Nigel that these are all tools that's going to create better content. The viewer and consumer in me, and a music fan particularly, I, if the minute he said that was artificial or I found out that was an artificial artist, turn it off. Yeah. I'm not interested. And anybody who is into their music, I'm an audiophile, I play vinyl and stuff, but I wouldn't go to that level. I'd just say, I, I hate the manufactured model of music. I bet you've got a shed in the bottom of your garden, haven't you? Yeah, that's me. Yes, yeah. with, with the violin. Yeah. But, you know, Nothing I, wrong with that. I think the same, I think this, completely agree with Nigel, that, yeah. that the human stories and, and, and that will, I think, yeah. is always going to be core to yes. a, a, you know, a TV experience and a cinematic experience. I'm going to go to the audience in just a moment. Just that point on the regulator then. Uh, Khalid, you may want to come in here as well. I mean, what is the future role of the regulator? Can you regulate an industry that, as we've seen the shape of the future for TV, looks like it's um, unregulated, if I can say that word? Well, I mean, look, you, you're, going, you're going to have to, right? And, that, and, and I think that's the issue. And, and I think we've seen, through lots of different periods of change in industry, the regulator has always had to play a really important role. So whether it's turning off analog TV and moving to digital, that wouldn't have happened without a coordinated process of Ofcom and government planning, right? There are even things which are, won't be as well known as that. So there was a time when I was in Ofcom where, 
you know, the, the, w w when, when the BBC was trying to launch iPlayer, when Channel 4 was trying to launch 4OD, as it was called, um, actually there was a standoff between producers and broadcasters over rights on on-demand platforms. And actually we as Ofcom at the time had to basically br bring parties together to broker that agreement and make it happen. So, again, a as we're driving forward into a world where you need to regulate against fake news, whether it's, you know, uh, w w or, or whether it's just regulate or, or plan for a world where traditional TV ceases to exist, you've got to have a strong forward-thinking regulator that can do that. Well, we shouldn't forget the fact that the... Um, broadcast regulation of 2000, bracket 2003, was out of date the day it was written. Yeah. We, well, I remember standing around in 2000 when Stephen was his name was chairman. We were looking at it doesn't, it barely mentions the internet. The internet yeah. is crashing over us, yeah. and this piece of brand new shiny broadcast no legislation yeah. barely regulated. Mm -hmm. So we, we've been labouring for 20 years under a set of broadcast and TV regulatory, regulations that has no kind of a bearing on the future we're living in. Yeah. So how will that change then, and, and who will bring that change? Bring regulators into the process. Yeah. So that's what mm -hmm. I so globally, that's what we do, whether it's the FDA, whether it's the CAA, FAA, yeah. so whether it's Ofgem. For example, we go and have conversations with Ofgem, basically, and you ask them, albeit basically about energy, and say, do you, have a, do you understand basically the impact of artificial intelligence on the European energy grid, you know, blockchain, all this? And yeah, AI, they go, well, we kind of have a bit of a point of view there. <coughs> blockchain, mm, not so much. Basically, quantum computing, not so much. Um, what happens when they all come together? Well, we don't really have a point of view on that at all. What happens when you get a fully autonomous energy grid? We have, haven't even thought about that yet. And as Ofgem say, basically they say, you know, we are a bunch of lawyers and policy wonks. You know? and then, but then you ask them and say, okay, so if you wanted a view, basically, of these different technologies and their impact on the future, uh, or how they can be combined to start changing your industry, take deep fakes, um, yeah, where do you go? And most of the regulators, basically, that I talk through, basically, around the, around the world go, we haven't really got anywhere. Mm. And that's part of the problem. They haven't really, on the one hand, trying to get visibility of some of this stuff is difficult. Secondly, what if they have visibility of it, trying to find people who can make sense of it for them, uh, and then try to sort of identify the risk and everything else, there are even fewer of those about. And then, all of a sudden, you have this crazy future that's coming through, basically, with all these different changes. If you have a look at deepfakes, you know, the European, the European Union at the moment, basically, is being uh, given information on deepfakes, basically, that are kind of generation version two. And I know that because it's one based on my information. Um, because the company that's doing it took my information and just thumped it through to them. Yeah, you know, with some of these deepfakes that we're seeing now, we're on generation six in the labs. So, just on deepfakes. So, I saw deepfakes four years ago. I was playing videos, basically, at the RAC, the Automobile Club, showing deepfakes. And yet, it's three years behind the curve. We start talking about deepfakes and the impact on society. And so, of course, the regulators are way behind. But the best way I've found to, to work with them is you bring them, into, and you bring them into the startup ecosystems, you bring them into the labs, you sort of expose them to this stuff so they can start prodding the bear and asking questions and that kind of stuff. And if startups are using all these technologies to create new things, the regulator is by their side and can say, if you create it like this, I'll say no. But if you do it like this, I might say yes. So it's it's not, they don't stand in isolation. They've got to come together. Yeah. Yeah. And from the beginning part of the journey. Okay, let's open up to the floor there. There's a lady here that's caught my eye. Um, there's a microphone coming over to you as well. If you wouldn't mind just quickly introducing yourself and then your question as well. I think we had another one up there, so we can get a microphone ready to um, person with, I think it's a burgundy top and glasses. Hello there. Hi. Uh, my name is Christine Geraghty, and thank you very much to the panel. Though I am forced to comment that it does look from here as if the future of TV is May. Oh, well yeah. <laughs> um, but my question is actually, I wanted if you could comment on the environmental impact of 5G and the developments that you've been talking about. Are we looking at anything remotely carbon neutral in all this activity? Would you, yeah, go, go for it, Mark. Actually, it's... It's the most energy efficient of mobile generations that have come along. You know, it's, it's tremendously efficient in terms of the new technologies, antenna technologies, um, devices and things. I think it is that certainly more um, energy efficient than it's ever been. But I think also it's the benefits it brings in terms of the ability to see and speak and, and to watch wherever and however you are without having to travel, for example. So I think it's bringing more of those kind of abilities to communicate without having to travel. Um, 
I think 5G is going to be a revolution in a number of different things, particularly in the efficiencies it can bring to industries to make buildings smarter, for example, mm -hmm. and to prever preserve, you know, for, for lighting and making sure if there's no one in a room, the lights aren't on. That in IoT-based machine-to-machine efficiencies, and uh, it, uh, there's going to be a myriad of those mm -hmm. where 5G can bring new efficiencies to industries and to consumers and... Uh, so the smart cities is probably at, towards the end of the yeah, 5G sense, line. Yeah, sensors and yeah. ensuring, you know, that the, the, there's a flow of communication around parking spots or if we're still parking, but public transport and all of the things are going to be enabled that I don't think we've even envisioned mm. that are going to bring new levels of, of energy um, mm. uh, savings. Has that convinced you? I don't know. Do you? Yeah. No? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what are okay. your concerns? Can I ask what your concerns are? of streaming a film now is huge, isn't it? It's never talked about compared with the use of cars. But the, it, the it is of it's streaming films. Streaming, yes. just doing yeah. ordinary activity of streaming yeah. is, it has a carbon footprint that people don't really talk about. So, yes, maybe it's more efficient, but if you've got billions more people doing it, it just needs thinking about, I think. Mm. I, yeah. I don't know. I haven't looked at the efficiency of television yeah. and what that does compared to streaming. I think. Although this would come down to the energy generation mix. Because if you're, if you're, you're absolutely right, streaming basically will suck energy. You know, 23 mm. screens in a TV in a house basically cannot be energy efficient. <laughs> um, however, if you start switching from, say, oil and gas or coal-fired power stations and you start moving to renewables, bearing in mind, so I work with Centrica, um, when you have a look at basically the when you have a look at the energy footprint of renewables, basically we've got a path on solar to go from 27% energy efficient on solar to 80%. So increasingly, when you have a look at the energy mix, the energy you need to decarbonise the energy footprint, and then if we decarbonise the energy generation <laughs> product, then you can start arguably you can then start streaming as much as you like because with reducing the carbon footprint up. up Sort of upstream, but yeah, I mean, you know, I don't think you're ever going to get, you're never going to get a smartphone that's energy efficient, for example, or a TV that's energy efficient, or any of that sort of stuff. So you need to decarbonise basically where we produce the energy until you go 100% renewable. Yeah, which and we were, so we're already at one trillion watts of installed renewable energy, and the world is running on about six trillion watts. So we've got a long way to go, but we've crossed the one, we've crossed the one trillion watt barrier. Yep. Okay. We're getting somewhere, especially so, in the UK. Thank you very much for that question. Hello there. Hi, um, Edward Mullion. I'm a television producer. Um, fascinating stuff. Um, it was interesting to hear about the 5G network. Um, it seems that in many cases, uh, your developments around tech, um, content uh, creation and uh, delivery is limited by the global global adoption of various technologies, be it you know mobile networks, etc. I was just wondering if you could speak at all to um, the emergence of global uh, data networks. So I'm thinking about things like satellite delivery of internet, that type of thing, and and how that might impact access to a lot a lot larger audience that wasn't accessible before and their ability to interact with broadcasters. Great question. Who wants that? Yep. Yeah, give it so, a go. So, um, no, you're absolutely right. But if you have a look, so today, basically, we've got three and a half billion people on the planet connected. The other three and a half billion people have either got no access to internet or crappy access to internet. So, when you have a look at low Earth orbit satellites like Space Link, OneWeb, all that kind of stuff, you know, Elon Musk is throwing up 12,000 satellites into low Earth orbit. Um, increasingly, basically, over the next 10 years, albeit that we're shutting out the stars, and that's going to be an issue. Um, that needs to get resolved. Um, the, the, fu the future of mobile communications is generally going to be less about backhaul fibre and it's going to be more about 5G. Uh, why gig basically in the home? Because if you're running 5G to your home, um, then your current Wi-Fi router isn't going to fly. So you need Y gig or Wi-Fi 6. Um, but then when you start combining those 5G and 4G and LTE networks basically with low Earth orbit satellites, um, all of a sudden, your total, on the one hand, your total addressable market goes from 3.5 billion people, if you're Netflix, for example, to 7, 7.5 billion people. Um, because with these low Earth orbit satellites, basically all you need is a Wi-Fi spot yeah, or a, state, a base station within a village, and you can blanket it with Wi-Fi and 4G. 
you know, now getting 5G basically out of a, out of a low Earth orbit satellite, basically that's going to be about 10 years. To, that's going to be 10 years time, but that's a software upgrade. And we've already got the we've already got the optics to do that. But um, yeah, you know, we're bringing the other with the other three and a half billion people on the on the planet online. I think there's a business model question to yeah. that. Oh, there is. Yeah. So, um, so I think you know, I've known lots of companies and, and organizations that have tried, attempted to do that, but yeah. the business model doesn't stack up when you're dealing particularly with some of these rural populations. That you're talking yeah. About. Well, this is so one of the business models that's being floated at the moment, where it says you provide a hundred, you provide a hundred dollar base station. It depends what you want to connect up, to be fair. But if you want to connect up a remote village in Africa, you know, we're doing it already. Yeah, it's a hundred dollar base station. Now, on the one hand, when you have a look at, say, SpaceX, you've got a multi-sided business where they're able to take money from one part of the business and feed it into SpaceX. But and you're absolutely right. You've got this problem of build it and then they will come. However, there's a, there's a big cost in building this. Mm -hmm. So Elon Musk, for example, has now petitioned the, F the FCC uh, to put down a million base stations in the US. But when you look at blanket coverage for the US, yeah, you need tens of millions of base stations. Yeah. So you do have a scalability problem. You've got a deployment problem as well. But that's a capital and a time issue. Uh, and if you've got the money and you're operating multi-sided businesses particularly, then there is a way to roll it out gradually. I was with, I was with you on this. I was sitting there thinking, the rights laws will stop all this. Yeah. Yeah. You might build a global network that can move content within milliseconds between every environment. Yeah. But Who's if, gonna if pay we're for still it? selling football on, on <laughs> Ireland, England, yeah. Holland, and separate rights packages, yeah. you, you can make it as great as you like. The rights laws will, will yeah. bung all this up for years. Yeah. <laughs> you can't have those Nigerian soaps going. in Malawi, mate, because <laughs> I've, I've got the rights sewn up. Yeah. 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 Okay. Got one last question we can take from the audience here. We can be around afterwards, I think, because we've got a. 8.15 we were meant to finish, but we were told we can go to 8.30, so we'll just take a question from this gentleman here. Hello there. Uh, hello, Krishna Aurora. I work for um, uh, an old-fashioned legacy public broadcaster yeah. called uh, SBS, which is in Australia. Um, it was just a... Uh, it's really a remark rather than a question, to be honest, um, but it seems to me that the, the problem we will have in the future is turning um, viewers into consumers. Over the last few years, we've been deluging, you know, Mark's kids and probably everybody else's kids with free content or content that they think is free. Um, and we're now getting to the point where you have to monetize it. Netflix has to pay back the debt mountain. It's going to demand individual subscriptions. We've, how are we going to do that? How are we going to get um, audiences or, or just individual viewers to accept ads and accept the monetization of the content that they have yeah. been used to getting. Carl, I'll get Carl lead and then yes. yeah, Peter can comment as well. well. Yeah, no, I'm, look, I was, I was going to say that, that I mean, I, actually, I'm, I'm not sure there is as much of a barrier to acceptance of ads as we might think, right? You know, it's, you know, ads have paid for TV content in the UK since 1955, right? And, 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 and you know, as you say, IT, you know, ITV may not be as big as it was on main channel, but it's got a wide, ra wide range of routes to market now. So, um, you know, and, 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 and you know, back, and back to the point that, that, that even, I mean, YouTube vloggers are making money off ads, you know? I mean, that, 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 that's the world we're in. Oh, I was going to bring that case up. Yesterday's yeah, number, yeah. numbers announcement. YouTube is taking 20% of all US TV budgets. Yeah. So, you know, that, that notional, my kids don't watch TV, they're watching YouTube. Yeah, they're watching the biggest AVOD supported <laughs> TV <laughs> service uh, that's out there. Yeah, I think yeah. that's right. I think that's right. Hmm. And that will increase over time as well as older generations take up the habits of the younger generation as well. Do you? Yeah. Well, yeah, well, I mean, that, I mean, I get both that, that and you know, let's not underestimate the importance or, or the ongoing, you know, life of traditional means of television, you know, and, and, and consumption of content, you know. And also, I'm not sure these, these stereotypes of old people and that stack up. I went around to my old man's the other day, he's 90 years old, he's got a UV box, and he said, you know, I was a bit worried about the quality of the signal on BBC One, so I press a uh, green button, we flick it onto the IP stream from iPlayer, we watch BBC One stream on iPlayer. Yeah. All right, Dad, rock on. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he taught you everything he, he knows. He's not a techie. He's yeah. not a techie. He's in the car train. You know, he's sitting there, he's flicking between DTT and yeah. IP to get yeah. the better signal so he can watch live BBC One. Yeah, maybe um, we'll get him here next it's year. Just about, it's just about presenting this stuff in human terms. And he was yeah. like, fine, press yeah. two buttons, I'll get a better signal. Yeah. So I, I, do, I do think we have to be careful 
careful not to fall into these old stereotypical yeah. traps. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. But, but, yeah. I think, but I think Christian has a point about it's the but the mindset of the broadcaster and and you know the content owner matters a lot, right? So if you take I was interested something like the BBC, the you know the BBC will say that the, the license fee is not a subscription. The license fee is a, a legal requirement, right? Um, until a couple of years ago, the license fee unit was part of the kind of the finance function, the overhead function, the director, deputy director general's office. Now it's part of the customer function. So I think there's a, there's a general shifted mindset that is required in both traditional and, you know, uh, uh, new players, right? Yeah. And I think it's very important that we read the audience because uh, people are going to be leaving quite soon and we'll just yeah, be yeah, yeah. talking to ourselves. So, a quick but on that point, just one quick thing in terms yeah. of shifting, shifting mindsets. Netflix, as, every, as part of every single platform deal that they're doing now, are requesting an EPG slot. Netflix is channel 204 on Virgin. Netflix has moved from being this thing, which is not even in TV, which is going to kill it, to being on TV in the App Store. Now it's on TV in the App Store and the search function. Now it's on TV, the App Store, and it's in the, in the EPG. They have had to realise that the, the busiest part of the TV platform is still the linear broadcast programme guide. And so Netflix have had to change their mindset yeah. And, and play the way the rest of the yeah. industry plays. Well, I think we could go on for hours, yeah, couldn't we? Could. But I think we've got to think about the audience who need to get back in time for news night, as we yeah. promised them um, <laughs> when they signed up for this. So thank you very much to Mark Smith, uh, Khalid Hayat, Nigel Wally, Matthew Griffin. Thank you. Thank you.